Here we are at the third episode of analyzing Netflix's Avatar adaptation through the lens of a martial artist. And this time, we've got some changes. Not only is it the first episode to juggle blending like five episode plot lines together for the sake of an eight episode season, but we have an entirely different director and writer behind the scenes. And to top it all off, we are introduced to this adaptation's versions of two of my favorite characters from the entire franchise with the debut of Ty Lee and Azula. But what about the action? Did it really need a new director at the helm, or are there still fundamental issues with their core approach that are holding it back? Obviously, my job is never easy, because not only did this episode have the best fight scene in this adaptation by far, but it also had one of the absolute lowest trash tier action sequences in the entire franchise, right down there with a lot of M. Night Shyamalan's version. But that's enough teasing, it's time to bow in. So we can break down all of the martial arts in homage. Alrighty, so episode 3 opens on a firebender resistance meeting that not only immediately fails to assassinate Ozai, but also fails to establish any of these characters as possessing even the slightest bit of common sense. I sense no danger here. I've done my best to avoid discussing this topic and have actively cut any time I've mentioned it out of my previous scripts, but I will at the very least acknowledge it here. The logic behind a lot of these scenes, as well as the fights, is severely lacking. I know that breaking down the logic in movies is kind of a moot point because that defeats the purpose a little bit, but sincerely, how was this assassination supposed to work? They just walked into the Fire Lord's office? Meeting room? throne? I, I don't even know what this place is supposed to be. But I guess they were expecting to catch him here. However, I'd be here all f day if I kept questioning the logic of every decision the individual characters make, so I'll just stick to questioning the fight and action choreography choices instead. Besides, this was all just an elaborate excuse to introduce this version of Azula. Isn't that right? Azula. And there is plenty to talk about with that character, however, I'm gonna wait until she is with her squad before I say my complete piece. I will admit though, this girl being revealed to be Azula would have fooled my ass too because that was not what I was expecting either. Five minutes into the episode and we get our first taste of martial arts when Katara is practicing with the waterbending scroll again. I just gotta hand it to her man, do you have any idea how difficult it would be to learn Tai Chi Chuan from a book? I will also call myself out here and admit that I just love to watch heroes fail and train. That struggle is so realistic and it makes everything so much better when they finally achieve their goals or learn what it is they're trying to learn. However, I do have a bit of a complaint here about Aang's mindset with bending. The monks always told us to find a place where emotion meets spirit. A place deeper than thought. Tap into your feelings and gather energy from them. Airbending nomads are heavily inspired by Tibetan and Shaolin Buddhists, and there is entirely too much to get into when it comes to the subject of emotions and feelings within Buddhism, but the core idea is that you become cognizant of them and watch them develop before releasing them and allowing them all to pass through you. But what Aang says kinda goes against the whole idea behind airbending itself. Tap into your feelings and gather energy from them. You see, the benders were supposed to be able to get more in sync with their respective elements by harmonizing themselves more alongside them. You've got to be steady and strong. Rock is a stubborn element. If you're going to move it, you've got to be like a rock yourself. Aang's advice about tapping into your feelings and gathering energy from them works for a waterbender because waterbending is inherently tied to Taoism. It would even work for a firebender for obvious reasons. But it's weird to hear that coming from an air monk. Not saying it's completely wrong, but I am saying it's these little discrepancies that make you call into question the depth of the writer's knowledge on the subject. Yet, much like the first scene, this was all set up to serve as a payoff for later, and I'll get to that plot point when we arrive there. Despite Aang's advice, Katara still fails, which is a good touch, and even though his delivery here is stifled... Monks always said I never listened. I think that's what they said. This is still pretty funny. The best waterbending masters in the world. 
I might even listen to them. So we cut from the net gang to my favorite character so far, and I promise I'm doing my best not to go over every dialogue scene, but there's something I want to point out here. While I completely understand that the writers are setting up Zuko's snappy attitude towards Lieutenant G to be directly tied and informed by his own speaking up out of turn, which is the root cause to how he got his scar to begin with, this line is still tasteless. I spoke to some of his crew. Word is, Zhao failed his officer training program three times. You did not need to make Zhao seem more incompetent just for the sake of selling Zuko's trauma. Not only does this make your own interpretation of the character seem objectively weaker, but you're almost baiting fans of the original to hate you for the change. Nobody likes Zhao as a person, but most people loved him as a villain, and part of why that is was because even though he'd get clowned on by a literal clown, Ahoy! I'm Admiral Zhao! He was still a serious, conniving, and powerful force to be reckoned with. This feels like whoever wrote the line either didn't like the character or thought, the fans hate this guy and they're gonna love this. Wrong, 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 wrong. Way to miss the point. Also, for the sake of my own curiosity here, what exactly is wrong with failing a few times before finally succeeding? Due to G's delivery in the social context of the situation, this is intended to be an insult that the audience gets enjoyment out of. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. But now, I feel like not only did you misread why fans liked this dude to begin with, but you also treat repeatedly failing educational, military, or training programs as something to be laughed at. Interesting choice in a remake of a show where characters failed a lot. <laughs> Sorry for the tangent, but just know that it doesn't matter how many times any of you fail at something, it's okay to try and fail, and I won't laugh at you. Unless, of course, you land on your face. And I mean literally, not metaphorically. See, I laugh at myself all the time. It's also why I can't do math. But it's time to get back on track. After that scene, somebody who is definitely not Jet helps sneak the net gang into Omashu, and I'll say that even if the stance could be deeper, this is some hung guard here that they're using to open up the doors to the city, and it's a pretty good shot. Nice. Hi, Cabbage Man. Unfortunately, before Aang can get pissed off at this guy for cultural appropriation, an explosion goes off, and we get some more bending action. All right, while I think Jabbar Raisani, I hope I pronounced that right, has already done a better job than Michael Goy when it comes to directing, I still get annoyed by these hero shots here. Aang is performing a nice staff flourish, but instead of pulling back the camera so we could see it and the special effects better, we are pulled in close on his upper body, which makes this shot stand out as strange compared to the next ones of Aang blowing out the flames and Katara bending some water. Those are pulled back and the focus of the shot is entirely on the movements and taking care of the fires. When you have shots like this, you're telling the audience that the thing that matters is the cool person posing. While shots like these say that what the character is doing is the thing that matters. And I promise, this isn't a big deal, I'm just sharing some education on framing priorities and highlighting a tiny discrepancy here. After this, we're given some visuals of how the city has changed and been impacted by the violence of war, but despite getting more of the same talk about Aang's mission, I actually enjoy taking the time to look at how the carnage affects common people. But now, it is time to address one of the most controversial parts of the show. And when I say a controversial part, I mean people complaining about casting. Let's get the archery out of the way first. I'm not exactly what you'd call a bowman, but I do know that there are ways you're supposed to orient your arm or your grip so that the bowstring doesn't slap the dog shit out of your arm like it does Azula's here. Point is, she doesn't really look like she has a ton of experience with a bow here. And that leads to the point I'd like to make about Azula and her team. I've seen a bunch, and I mean a bunch, of people shitting on these three for their physique. And I have to point something out here. Yes, they're on the heavier end compared to their animated counterparts, as are most people in real life. But it is so important to keep in mind that these three characters are not the same as these three characters. We're only on episode three, 
But so much of the story, world building, and actual characterization has been altered enough to a point where the difference in body type compared to the source material is a non fing issue in this universe. No, Elizabeth Yu does not look like she's ever done a backflip in her life, much less done a fucking elbow lever into an L sit without letting her feet touch the ground. But that's okay, because this Azula hasn't either. Since, as we've seen, the stronger you apparently get with the force, with the bending, the less you have to move. Which means her being on the heavier end is perfectly justified. This Azula isn't as lean because in this world she doesn't have to be in order to still be great at firebending. That's also why this Tai Lee wasn't introduced in a handstand like the original. Azula! So cute. Bye -bye. It's probably because the actress can't do it, but since we have been given zero context as to who she even is at this point, it could also be due to her not being an acrobat in this adaptation. Finally, not to be rude towards the actress, but I have zero interest or care at all about Mei. However, that's mainly because Mei was my least favorite recurring character in the original show for a variety of reasons. If she sucks here, it's way more of a lateral move compared to every other character. Again, in my opinion. So please, stop giving the actresses shit for looking the way they do when these versions of the characters don't have to move like their animated counterparts. Unless, of course, this show later reveals that they are supposed to move and fight like the originals, at which case, bitch out the casting department and showrunner for picking them to begin with. Leave the actresses alone. So, what can you do about it? <laughs> Although, maybe get another take on some of these lines. Whew. On a much more positive note, this is a great match cut, and I'll never get tired of seeing Zuko, Iroh, and Zhao. Nor will I ever get tired of watching people train, even if they couldn't be bothered to actually throw water on her. I mean, check it out, there's no water dripping off her face after the splash. For the record, this is another instance of me questioning my sanity. Am I crazy here? There's these frames where her skin has that wet texture, but then when she moves her hand out of the way, it looks dry again. And there's no droplets anywhere. If I'm wrong, please tell me, but if not, holy shit, guys. Well, as if I didn't have enough evidence that I was a left-handed blonde dumbass, it took until this scene for me to realize this guy is Jet. For one thing, hell yeah, Jet. But for another, let's acknowledge just how much role compression this episode has for the series as a whole. It combines Jet, the Northern Air Temple, Omashu, Azula and her team's debut, and I'm going to assume Iroh's capture by Earth Kingdom soldiers from the Winter Solstice episode. Spoilers. And what's crazy to me is if you removed the previous knowledge of all those original episodes, this flows shockingly well. I've gotta hand it to you, Christine Boylan. Your character dialogue may be weak, but this is a good way to merge these plot lines. Part of my stupid book one joke from the first video that I was justifiably called out for was partially informed by the adventure of the day nature of some of these first season episodes, and this rectifies that a bit. But I know why you're here. Let's talk about these fight scenes, starting with Jet and Katara versus the three firebender spies. And the very first thing I notice is that these two dudes on the side throw vertical fists while the spy in the middle does this silly casting motion. Even though I am truly grateful to see some more Shaolin inspiration in these movements, the guy in the middle becomes even more noticeable because of how good the two on his sides look. I'll be honest, I'm not a fan of this main firebender guy. He must have been an actual actor or something because all of his firebending looks like the casting from episode 1, which just gets more apparent as the fight scene continues on. Then we get to this bit where Jet uses his tiger heads to deflect the fireball, which was done with another vertical fist by the way, you'll love to see it. And it looks rough because not only would the direction Jet is spinning in send the blast to the opposite side of himself, but the effect is not even lined up correctly with the fist. From this angle, it's flying directly towards his hook sword, not him. The hiccup is honestly more on the visual effects side in my opinion, because this shot is meant to highlight the conjoining of the hooks. I just think they should have deflected it away from the dude instead of shooting the gap between them. And yes, in case anybody is wondering, three episodes in, I do in fact catch all this shit when I'm watching it the first time, because I am that obsessed with fight scenes and martial arts. I don't comb through this frame by frame looking for mistakes. These hiccups stand out to me even at full speed. 
Regardless, conjoining the hook swords is a real technique, and I like the framing here where the firebender dodges, which leads to the inside of the crescent guard catching the other dude's arm. This happens, and therefore, this happens. While I'm annoyed that this leg hook from earlier didn't cut anybody, it's excused with the arm grab because typically the inside of the moon guard isn't sharpened on the Huto Go. To cap off this portion of the battle though, we have Jet catch another Shakunets Hodokin while Katara uses some Tai Chi Chuan to nail the dude. The most glaring recurring issue that I'm seeing in these fights is that there's too much pausing in between the beats for my taste. I feel like, ironically enough, Katara is really stagnant for most of these fights, and she should have already pulled the water out or at least been prepped by the time Jet got hit. Also, starting to get pretty irritating when people get hit by fire or water all the time, but nobody is burned or wet. After this though, the two of them get surrounded, so Jet calls in the gang, and suddenly, this sh gets awful. Not Pipsqueak laying this dude the f out, that was a great beat. I'm talking about this horrendous piece with Smellerby, which is by far the absolute worst section of choreography in the entire show. Let's ignore that the places Smellerby slices aren't even the places that are open when we cut to this guy before the Duke knocks him out, or that there are continuity errors with arm placements or footwork. And you know what, I'm feeling good today. Let's also ignore the fact that they're just spinning around, using everybody's favorite awkward close-ups so that we can hide the fact they're not really doing anything that even remotely resembles martial arts. No, how about we start with the fundamentals? Like how you shouldn't put your fingers on the fucking blade of your knives. You are in fact seeing this correctly. Smeller B is holding the blades in their hand with a finger resting against the edge the entire time. How did nobody catch this? The sheer laziness and fuck it attitude they had with this part almost taints the rest of the fight because of how absolutely pathetic it is. Tell me you have no idea what you're doing without telling me you have no idea what you're doing. Honestly, this bothers me so much, I'm f***ing done with the fight. I'll just show you the weird blocking error they had with Longshot instead of talking about it. Moving on. While Pipsqueak goes off to murder these guys, Katara gets shown around the Freedom Fighters HQ, and check this out. Yeah, those are European swords, so... yeah. I realize I'm skipping over plot stuff, however, I'm never gonna skip over Katara's improving skill, I guess, with waterbending. I'm starting to think that they only taught the actress like five movements, and I was really hoping they would have locked the bending progression down as far as significant improvements go until the North Pole. But that's enough of the Freedom Fighters for now, it's time to get back to the real heroes of the story. Zuko and Iroh, and uh, that's a conspiracy I'll have to get into one day. Based on the dialogue spoken here, I'm kinda worried that they're gonna turn Zuko's kiss with his dad's burning fist into a whole fight scene, which would grossly misunderstand the heartlessness of that moment. At the very least, in the next scene with Sokka, Katara, and Aang, I am so thankful that Sokka called out Katara's selfishness here. Reporting everything! You're wrong! This is just like you, Katara, willing to believe anything as long as it helps you. This is a seriously great moment, and it's nice when these vulnerabilities and character flaws are not only recognized, but called out by other cast members. But now it's time to get to my favorite part of the episode, and definitely the best fight scene so far in the show. I don't need fire to defeat this boy. Without further ado, let's break down the first rematch between Zuko and Aang. Okay, we open this fight with a B-twist roundhouse, and you can tell my boy Dallas is a tricker because of those crooked-ass legs when he's twisting. My Sufu calls me out on that all the time because I do the exact same thing. But this actually adds to the rough and unrefined aspect of Zuko as a character. I would expect Azula to have a perfect butterfly twist, not Zuko. Well, maybe not this Azula either. From here though, Zuko continues his combo, going directly into a front sweep and then delivering a beautiful step over hook. Not a fan of the spinning back fist, but I do like catching Aang with another roundhouse. Speaking of which, I love all of the subtle movements and handwork Aang has going on here. He's clearly not trying to actually fight back right now, and the youth of the character as well as the context of Aang trying not to break shit with his airbending lets me maintain my suspension. Or at least, that's what I'm assuming is the reason Aang isn't airbending right now. My only complaint is the overuse of slowdown and how it's still edited and filmed like a western movie instead of a Hong Kong fight. Also, these little airbending jumps from Aang, I mean, just say it man, they suck. 
Their awkward in motion, and because of how stilted his movement is, I would not be surprised if you told me that Aang is actually superimposed into this footage, instead of actually fighting with Zuko. Unfortunately, the next exchange between the two is also a little on the weaker end because Gordon is clearly further away than he should be from Dallas. And while this does help sell the idea that Aang is scared of Zuko here, it makes the fight feel a little too safe, you know what I mean? Especially because there are so many cuts in it. But like I said earlier in the video, I do love to see my characters get hit. And after a brief cut using Aang taking a sidekick to the chest, we see Sokka and Katara get ready to ride the earthbending carts to the palace, then resume the battle mid-chase. Zuko gets to cook with a staff while Aang shows he's perfectly fine with breaking people's shit anyways. So why bother doing this when you can quite literally blow Zuko away? Anyways, once we get done with the stupid plate breaking, we get a lovely Jackie Chan inspired evasion sequence using this basket. Then you cap it off with this tiny slap kick popping the stick into Zuko's head. A quick micro chase later, and if you've ever wondered what a Jackie Chan fight would look like with bad wire work, this is it. I'm particularly annoyed by this leg kick because I feel like they added a cut here since the boy couldn't fall at full speed. Even though Zuko getting slapped by this lady for beating up a child is hilarious, I'm a little let down by Aang's performance so far. He's doing his part, but I feel like they're having to overcompensate with the special effects, you know what I mean? On the whole, the second sequence is pretty solid though, but what holds it back is how out of place it is for these two characters. Much like the discrepancy with Suki grabbing Sokka's arm while he's still stretching, Aang is kinda mishandled here. Sure, Zuko has a limitation in place because he can't use his fire bending. But Aang has no excuse not to just blow Zuko 200 yards backwards. Uh, ah! Yeah, like that. I also think the limits of Gordon's physical acting, stunt skills, and martial arts experience are on full display, which leaves a little bit to be desired. But for now, let's get to the last bit. I'm personally unsure of what the point was with the curtains. Also, how did they end up in this position. Did somebody yank Aang backwards? I think they're trying to show off how circular Aang moves and his elusiveness, but this is just spinning, with only a hint of scarf work. And even though I am certain that the rapid editing was to make the audience feel how disoriented this is all supposed to be, it doesn't manage to hide how there's no substance to the choreography itself. It's like what a muggle thinks a Jackie Chan set piece is without any of the nuance. But this dialogue exchange that leads to Zuko finding out Aang's got his notebook is wonderful character-driven action. Even if, for me, the cabbage thing was a little bit too much. One more time, this fight gets interrupted though by Katara saving the king, and I just want to point out how much I love the subtle footwork she does here right before stopping the arrow. The moves may be getting repetitious at this point, but there are some subtleties she's genuinely managed to capture from the root art. And besides, she hasn't been formally trained yet, so maybe she does only know five moves. Getting back to the battle though, we get to see Aang's lovely Bagua Zhang on full display, and I adore the choice to make Iroh give himself up to the one time so Zuko could escape. Even if Iroh is using caster hands. Finally, the episode wraps up with one more bit of Bagua before Aang gets power posed on by the cops, setting us up for the next episode. So what's the takeaway here? For one thing, a different director's vision definitely helped. Even though there are still moments where the action is filmed up close, this time it feels more deliberate as opposed to aimless. Even then, that style of directing is a pretty bad choice for this subject matter, but we have to address the most important fact. This episode may have the best fight scene in the show so far, but it also has the absolute worst fight scene in the show and one of the worst fight scenes in the entire franchise, including the Shyamalan movie. I don't care how good the rest of it looks. If you can't tell your actors to not put their fingers on the blades of their knives in the shot, then you have fundamentally failed at action. Although I also want to point out that Mr. Raisani is also inexperienced with directing action, and I'm a little concerned because during the script writing process, Albert Kim stepped down as showrunner of the series, leaving Jabbar Raisani and Christine Boylan as the new showrunners. For those of you that may not be aware, a showrunner is basically the one that gets final verdict on everything. 
For TV shows, they're pretty much at the top when it comes to creative control. So if you didn't like the writing or directing in this and the next episode, unfortunately those two are in creative command of seasons 2 and 3 right now. But for me, I'm still enjoying Katara's bending, and obviously Zuko can pop off when the creative forces let him. There's still some rough spots like Gordon's obvious inexperience with fights and hiccups with the visual effects, but I'm sure that's going to improve in Season 2. But we're not in Season 2 yet, and we're not even halfway through this first set of 8. While I'm not the biggest fan of some of these character changes, especially with these three, I still need to see more before I can even begin to start judging performances. Maybe they won't be super good at fighting in this one because they don't have to be. This world plays by vastly different rules. Regardless, I personally believe that despite that awful stuff with Smellerby, this is still a good step up as far as action goes, even if it feels like Dallas Lou doesn't really have anybody else he can truly throw down with. But I'm genuinely curious, did I miss anything else here? What do you all think of these new changes? And was my explanation for Azula and the other Ozai's angels sufficient? Either way, I would love to know what you think down below, and if you enjoyed the video, please feel free to like and sub. But until next time, I'm bowing out. And I'll see you all into the dark.